we're back. Welcome to video three. And on this one, we're going to be looking at some very important organs in more, more detail where you don't just need to know this is a heart, but you need to know aspects of the organ. So here we're gonna be hitting the heart. First, we're gonna be looking at the rabbit heart. Then we're gonna be looking at a model of a human heart. We're gonna be dissecting a sheep brain. Then we're gonna be looking at a human brain model. And then we're going to look at a sheep eye. That's gonna be the quickest dissection we've ever done. Not much there. Then we're gonna look at a model of an eye. And then we have an ear model we're gonna look at just to look at that. And we'll go over everything that you need to know for these. So first of all, this is the rabbit heart. You can see, uh, cause they're nice color coded. Again, we got the red latex in the aorta. This is going out. And we got the blue latex in you know, where we have the vena cavas coming together. And so then, you know, we have the four main chambers of the heart. These are your atria. And then we have the right and left ventricle. So this is, let's, let's put it here, right and left ventricle. So the bigger one, is going to be, there we go, my head. the bigger one that is sending all of the blood flow to the body, that is the left ventricle, and then the one that is sending blood to just the lungs, that is the right ventricle. And so we're gonna open these up. Where my scalpel goes? There it is. So, and uh, we open this up. We're just gonna kind of cut like this and the rabbit heart is not going to be the easiest thing to look at because what we're going to see is we're going to be full of latex so we're not going to spend too much time here but there you can see the very thick walls of that ventricle and we're going to compare it to the not as thick walls of this ventricle and so again think about it you're in the body and I gotta remember which is my left and which is my right. But you know, you go with the left ventricle. This is the thick, thick walls because again, the left ventricle has to send the blood throughout the entire body. The right ventricle, well, just has to send it to the lungs. Lungs are gonna be right here. If you remember, you know, the heart is between the lungs and the thoracic cavity. So there's not a very long trip to go to the lungs. There's a pretty big trip to go around the entire body. And then you have your atria up here. Uh, I'll just cut through them a little bit. They're very thin walled though, because you know they're just sending, the, all they're doing is sending the blood from here to their corresponding ventricle. So again, you know, the way to really tell, even if you maybe can't tell you, you know, left from right, that well or everything's kind of moved around and you're not sure which is the front which is the back the thicker thicker walls of a ventricle that's going to be your left ventricle that's sending the blood out through the body the right right ventricle is the really thin thin walls so eh, i think that's about it for the uh actual rabbit heart so now we're gonna really just show you the same things bigger and cleaner in this model of the human heart. So here, okay, yep, human heart model. So use my somewhat clean pointer. So we have the aorta coming out here. And so this is the aorta that becomes, oops, becomes the descending aorta here. So this is coming out, sending blood to the body. We're going to have these branches come off that are going to send blood to the, the head and the arms. And then this goes down to serve the rest of the body. I'm just going to take that off because it's going to continually get in the way if it's on there. Here we have, you know, these, the uh, superior or the anterior vena cava coming in. Here is the, where the inferior or posterior vena cava or quadruped is coming in. And this is the pulmonary. So we got the pulmonary circulation here. So now pulmonary artery, pulmonary vein. Now remember arteries, we, we think of arteries as carrying the oxygenated blood and veins as carrying the deoxygenated blood. 
that falls apart when you're talking about the lungs. Um, arteries carry blood away from the heart. And if it's going to the lungs, that's deoxygenated blood. Veins carry blood to the heart. And if that's coming from the lungs, that's going to be oxygenated blood. So keep that in mind. So now we look here and we have our atria and we have our ventricles. And we're going to take this front plate off and we'll see, you know, the sizes of these different chambers. And this is one thing that this is a nice model. It's not the best model. And the one way it's not the best model is the size of the muscular walls here to let you see what's happening here in the left ventricle. These walls should be much thicker. You shouldn't have as much space as you have, but yeah, it is what it is. So we have our left ventricle. We have our right. So here, we'll take this off too, and we'll take this. This will be going on and off as we kind of walk our way through. So blood will come in. Yep, blood will come in. And here, we're going to go into, actually, no, that's right. This is where the, this is cold. Took it off already? I don't know where it's going. Anyway, blood's coming in here, or blood is coming from back here, and it's going to go into the right atrium. Okay, from the right atrium, it's going to go down. You know, this one-way flow into the right ventricle and the right ventricle is going to contract and it's going to go up here into the pulmonary artery it's going to go to the lungs it's going to come back from the lungs via the pulmonary vein and then it's going to drop into the pulmonary vein over here it's going to drop into the the left ventricle and it's going to go down from the left, I mean, it's going to go into the left atrium, it's going to go to the left atrium, drop down into the left ventricle, then it'll go out and get passed through the entire body through, here we go, yeah, that's right, this is where the aorta is coming out on this model. Um, now, that, I went over that pretty quickly because we're going to go through that in lecture again with a bunch of slides, step by step by step, so, you know, this is supplementary, that's probably already going to be out when this video is out, or maybe not, but everything will be out by the time you know you're tested on any of this um, so the parts that you might need to know there might be photos on your lab exam is you know things that you should know on this heart model is that this is the aorta you don't need to know specifically this is the ascending aorta or anything you just need to know this is the aorta and this is taking blood out to the body this is the pulmonary artery this is taking deoxygenated blood to the lungs where it would be oxygenated. This is, you know, where the vena cava are coming. You know, this is the inferior, uh, sorry, superior or anterior vena cava, you know, bringing blood back to the heart. This is where the pulmonary veins are taking oxygenated blood back into the heart. That, you know, this is the left atrium, the right atrium, left ventricle, right ventricle, especially if I take this plate off, you know, left ventricle, right ventricle, and you know, if we flip it over, you know, here's your inferior vena cava, and here are your cardiac uh, arteries and veins themselves. And again, as we'll talk about in lecture, these are the, a lot of people when they hear about blockages and everything, they think something's blocked inside the heart. No, the the pressure is so high in the heart, that's not what's happening. It's not like you're going to have a lot of blockages here. I mean, you you may, but you're really working at it if you're doing that. These are the blood vessels that get blocked and it's blood flow to your heart itself because this cardiac muscle here needs oxygen as well and the blood inside is flowing way, way too quickly to have any diffusion occur. So that, again, that's an overview of the heart structures. Again, I went through that pretty quickly because the lecture exam is also going through that. Uh, not the lecture exam, the lecture, uh, the lecture PowerPoints. The lecture exam will hit it too. It'll be hit everywhere. Okay, now we're going to move to the brains. So here is our, that is the sheep brain, and whew, a lot of preservative coming off that sheep brain. We've got the sheep brain and the rabbit brain. And so first we're gonna look at the gross structures and what are their structures on the sheep? There we go. So the gross structures that you're going to have to know, use the same way. So we have our cerebrum, 
It's just this big, you know, this is the cerebrum here, here, you know, it's this big part that we like to think of as, you know, the thinking part of the brain. It's also called the neocortex, the, the fancy part, the, the part where all your thoughts generally happen. And then we have the cerebellum, which is posterior to here. And, you know, it, the name kind of means little cerebrum, but it's not actually an outpocketing of the cerebrum. It's an outpocketing of the brainstem itself. So you can see here, we push the sheet brain down. The cerebellum is not connected to the cerebrum. And you can see the same thing for the rabbit brain. Then um, we ha do have the brain stem itself, so right here. So, you know, we have the, you know, in the neocortex, the cerebrum, and then the brain stem. And this is what is going to smoothly just, just go right into the spinal cord. Um, it's not as well, we don't have as much of it here on the rabbit, but it's the same thing. You know, brain stem right here, spinal cord would come out very smooth. Um, we don't really see really good olfactory bulbs on, oh, there they are. We, we do have the olfactory bulbs here. So, much my hair there. so this sheet brain has already been kind of, um, it's had most of the protective covering taken off. So just here. Um, normally there is a heavy coating on there, the dura mater, which is this really dense connective tissue that covers the brain and protects it. It's not on this one. Uh, we do have a bit of the arachna and pia mater here. And again, these are things that are covered. A um, little bit in lecture, but don't worry about it. We're not really going to hit those. Um, but dividing the hemisphere here, because again, we have our two hemispheres of the cerebrum and the olfactory bulbs right here. There we go. I can partition out the olfactory bulbs. This one's damaged. This one's not. Um, this is just all cranial nerve one. You know, this is a sense of smell right here. And then we'll have the optic nerve here. So there we go. The cranial nerve two, the optic nerve is right underneath here. Um, you can see those a little bit. Not great. There will be better, better photos on your lab exam, probably off the model because the model looks really good. But here you can see cranial nerve two right here on the little tiny, little tiny rabbit brain. Now the rabbit brain is pretty smooth. The sheep brain is wrinkly. What are all these wrinkles? Well, these wrinkles are the sulci. So here, the you know, you have the sulci and the gyri of the brain, individual sulcus and gyrus, plural sulci and gyri. And what these are is this is going to give some um, more surface area to the brain because cell bodies of neurons are where all the processing happens. Like that is. The more cell bodies you have, the kind of more things you can do, to put it very, very simply. And it turns out cell bodies can only really be on the external surface of the brain. So as you get bigger and bigger and bigger, to, you want more and more surface area. So one way to do that is to get wrinkly. And here I'll just cut through this brain. Cuts really, really easily. And you can see here, here I'll finish cutting, that you know this gray matter, which is the cell bodies, you know, this doesn't go through the entire entire inside of the brain. We have all this white space here. That's the axons, that's the tails of the cell bodies. So these wrinkles that we have here gives the brain more surface area. And the wrinkles don't go that deep in the sheep, um, but the human brain is super wrinkly. Other really wrinkly brains, dolphins, um, you just get a lot, a lot of neurons in there. Um, other brain structures you need to know, first of all, you need to know these are brains. Um, you know, so we talked about, you know, cerebrum, cerebellum, brainstem. Um, here, this is fun to say, medulla oblongata, you know, structure on the brainstem. And, yeah, look at my list here. Um, different lobes, kind of hard to see in the sheep. Um, I'm gonna wait to go over different lobes in the model. So I guess get to the model. There's not not much to really talk about with the sheep brain. Um, yeah, cut in half. There we go. So 
that, that's one that's much a more fun dissection to do in person. Okay, so now we have this really, really nice human brain model to kind of show you some of the same things we were talking about. So the human brain, very different. The sheep brain in kind of a gross organization, maybe? Actually, it's not. Um, it looks different, but a lot of that is just due to how the brain has this flexion. So here you can see, it looks like our brain stem goes down, you know, ventrally from the brain and the sheep brain went out that way. Well, we're bipeds and our foramen magnum, that's the hole in the skull where the spinal cord comes out, it's at the bottom of our skull. Sheep is at the back. So the human brain in development develops a flexion, a bend, and that's why it looks very different. Um, but it's the same basic organization as the sheep brain. So we have our cerebrum, our cerebellum, and then we have our brain stem here, and you know, medulla oblongata is organ this structure on the brain stem. We have all these sulci, all these gyri here. We have the, this is the olfactory bulbs, which are very small in humans. We have cranial nerve two, the optic one. This is gonna go out to the eyes. Here's the pituitary. Here's all these different cranial nerves. You don't have to know the different cranial nerves. If you take AMP, you will more than have to know all the different cranial nerves, so we'll leave it for that. Um, the different lobes, parietal lobe, frontal lobe, occipital lobe, temporal lobe. You know, those are the major ones. If we cool thing about this model is again we take the brain in half. We see some structures on the inside. So here's the corpus callosum, you know, that unites the left and the right hemisphere. Here is the arbor vitae, which is basically this tree looking like thing that's inside the cerebrum. I'm sorry, cerebellum. Cerebellum. Again, cerebrum, this kind of higher thought, processing, you know, this is knowing what a flower looks like, knowing what a flower is, remembering that time you got flowers, remember that time you forgot to get somebody flowers, whatever. Um, cerebellum, this is your hand-eye coordination, balance, all those fun things. And brain stem, this comes kind of with the reptile brain or the hindbrain. This is things like uh, your, your diencephalon, your hypothalamus, your um, this is things like I'm too hot, I'm too cold, we'll start sweating, we'll stop, we'll start shivering, you know, any, anything like that. I'm thirsty, I'm hungry, uh, this is the pituitary here, this is going to be really important for regulation hormones, like, ah, oh, send more hormones out, you know, all, all of that stuff. And again, this is kind of a, an overview, you know, um, the uh, endocrine system lecture will hit some of this as well. You know, we talked about this in the nervous system lecture. Um, the brain, again, is really important, and we both know a lot about the brain and not a lot at the same time. We know all these different structures. We can tell you what part of what lobe of the human brain controls what, like, you know, vision is going to be back here. Um, but we also don't know. If we can't really tell you in great detail, for um, example, things about why certain, uh, why electrical impulses go through, give you a thought, or, you know, what the difference between, you know, different levels of consciousness is, and anything like that. Uh, and here you can see, if I take this brain apart a little bit, you can see, again, all these wrinkles here, they allow for more surface area, so again, more, more neurons crammed, crammed in there. So, that is the brain. Anything to add? Good. Nope. Okay. Now I'll get my gloves back on, we'll move this aside, and get to the quickest, or maybe the coolest, uh, dissection where we're going to be looking at the sheep eye. So again, the eye. Uh, cow. A cow eye. Cow eye. Yeah, I was like, well, that's awful, awful big for sheep. Yeah. So, <laughs> so used to everything being sheep. Um, and if you're wondering where we get, you know, why we're getting these organs like a, a cow eye or a sheep brain, um, well, lots of cows and sheep are farmed for meat, you know, and, but Burger King isn't buying the eyeballs from the cows. So this is, you know, kind of byproducts um, from the meat industry and they're sold to biological supply companies. So here we have a cow eye that is, no, not in the skull. And so 
again, unfortunately, biology is a bit of a paradox because the moment you kill something, it's not alive anymore by definition. And living cells are very different from dead cells. So, you know, the cloudy nature of this eye, that's not how it would be in life. You know, this is not perfect, but so we're gonna, we're gonna look at, okay, what do we see in here? And there's, first of all, all this connective tissue, all this fat around it. This is very useful because your eye is actually surrounded by fat. If you don't have some of this fat, you would have a bad time. It serves to cushion the eye so that it doesn't just bounce around in your socket completely every time you move. You need some of that cushioning. We've got muscles on here as well that will pull the eye in either direction. We'll look at that more in the model. That'll be easier to see. Um, we've got our optic nerve coming out the back here. This is what would go to the brain. This is, you know, cranial nerve two going all the way back to the brain. Um, but I'm going to just kind of, and here you can see how much um, a closed system this still is because, you know, I can press on this and make the eye pulsate a little bit. This has a lot of um, the t tension. It's got a lot of tension in there. It's got a lot of fluids, pressure. And it's very important that you have just the right amount of pressure in your eye. If you have too much, uh, that's one reason you ever go to the eye doctor and do that little puff of air there. They're basically testing how much how your, your eye's pressure. Too little can cause bad things to happen. Too much can cause bad things to happen. Too much is more common than too little. That can cause glaucoma. Basically part of your retina is dying because it can't get blood. Um, so we're just going to cut through here. I want to make some icky noises as we do and clear away some of this. And we're gonna, so here is the white part, the eyes sclera, this is the cornea, and we're gonna cut right, right through there. And we'll open this up. And we've got this liquids coming out, the aqueous humor, and there we go. Okay, if we open up the eye, there we go. Oh, I can see you in there, okay. We'll cut a little bit more this way to give us a better opening. Okay, what we see in here is, come on, let go. Yeah, the connective tissue on the eye, very, very firm, because that's what it has to do to do its job. Okay, so here, see in the eye, first of all, I'll take this out. This is the lens. So here's the lens of the cow eye. This is what the uh, light went through and was focused on the back of the eye. And here we can see, see this um, kind of reflective bit in there. So we'll have, you know, we have the retina and we have the blood vessels. And that, that's the eye. I mean, there is not too much there here. We'll take this out here. Here's the, I think I was giving the blood, there we go. See this reflective? bit there that's chock full of rods and cones and this um, Dipedium lucium um, non-human or not a lot of non-primate animals have kind of a more reflective surface in the back of the eye we, than we do this is why um, their eyes will shine in the dark this is what it's kind of shining off of and if we open this up a little bit more I shall cut cut this way better view at this angle. You can see there is the iris, the back of the iris, and that is what control, and we see muscles there, which are controlling the, the aperture of the iris and how much light would get in there or not. Because that's all the eye is, is an, a way to get light from the outside. And again, this is very clouded over because it's dead. The cornea is clouded. Um, but you know, as light gets in there, and the photoreceptive cells here, it causes a conformation change in the rhodopsins that are inside all of those rods and cone cells, uh, you know, from, you know, their uh, cis-trans configuration. And there we go, that's how animals see. It's very complicated and very simple at the same time. So it's a cool dissection, a quick, quick dissection. Um, so a lot of the, the nervous system is because again, it's very elegant, very simple at the same time. It's very cool too here. You can see how the different amounts of cells on the back of there. And cows can see colors. They can't see as many colors as we can, but they can see 
colors and um, basically the lighter areas are probably more more one cell type than the other. So there we go. Now we're gonna that's all the dissections, but we got some models and the camera might need to move for the eyeball because I'm not sure I can lay the eye down without it falling apart. So here is our eye model, human eye, but most eyes are the same. Again, we got our fat pad, and here we can see the muscles that we really didn't, I didn't take the time to separate out of the cow eye. I can tell you from past experience, those eyes are so old and preserved, it's really hard to see the different muscles anyway, so that's why we didn't bother. Um, but you have your optic muscles, and you got one that pulls the eye this way, Pulls the eye this way, this way, that way, and you got two angular ones. Don't worry about identifying those, just know they're there. And so the different structures, you have your scleria, that's the connective tissue all around the eye. Then you have your clear cornea up there. And then of course you have your optic nerve coming out the back. And then if we take off the top, there we go. Here's the blood rich supply, the blood supply for the eye, we got our cornea. There, we take the cornea off. Here we can see the iris. And again, this is what your pupil opens and closes based on your muscular constriction to allow light in there. And here is the lens. What you know, has light, gets light focused on. And it'll just focus light on the back. So here's your retina, you know, blood rich retina. And there is uh, what this thing here is not that you have an actual ball inside your eyeball. What this is representing is the um, fluids inside the eye that, again, they keep the eye inflated. Your eye pressure is extremely important to be regulated. Um, I believe it is way more common for you to get too much pressure in there than too little. Um, that can happen. So the eye again, pretty simple, pretty simple organ, but really, really important. And all its job is basically to get got a clear window for light to go through that will go to these receptor cells. The final model that we're going to talk about is. This is a model of the ear. And I just wanted to show you this to, again, kind of reiterate a few things we talked about in the sensory lecture. Um, so remember, that has, there we go, that's how that goes. Remember that, you know, the, so you have your outer ear. Your, this is all your outer ear. You get your eardrum, this is your middle ear, then you have your inner ear. And this is in the temporal bone, or technically the petrosal part of the temporal bone. And so this is your external ear, your pinnae. And we have, you know, all of this is the outer ear. Middle ear is from the eardrum going through the three middle ear bones, the malleus, incus, and stapes, also known as the hammer, anvil, and stirrup. And they conduct, this is the mammalian middle ear, this is the human, human ear. They conduct sound here, Go through here and then it goes in the inner ear. And again, the way this is set up reminds you hopefully that you know this is you're looking at a negative space because you don't have a bone that's shaped like this in your ear. You have a hollow space that's shaped like that. And here, this hollow space sound gets transmitted in here and it'll go up through this cold coiled cochlea and you know where the different pitch of sound will travel through the basal membrane at a different spot which will simulate the hair cells which will let you hear different pitches and your brain just learns to recognize this um this is why you know when babies are born they're a bit like 
ah, all the time because they're just getting sensory input and they don't they don't know what to do with it. It's the same reason that if people who are born deaf um, develop the ability to hear later in life due to surgery or what have you, they they can't process sounds right away. They need to learn what all these different nerve impulses coming in mean. And then you have the uh, auditory nerve here and then this whole other part of the ear. Remember, this is your sense of balance. Uh, you have your sarcocal urethral here, which allow you to basically know when you're in an elevator that's going left or right or up or down. And then you have your three semicircular canals. And these are allow for you to know kind of how you're moving in space. And again, this is why you get dizzy if you spin around in circles and stop because the fluid is still moving in here, but your eyes say, no, you're standing still. So that is an overview of the ear. So there we went over heart, went over brain, and then we hit a couple of the sensory organs and that is it. So that is your virtual laboratory exploration. I know it is not a complete replacement of doing this stuff in lab. Like it'd be really cool to be able to, you know, open the eye yourself because there, there's some stuff that you're just not going to see as well. You're not going to know how resistant some things were. You're not going to know the exact nature, but we're doing our best and uh, that's it. Uh, email me if you have any questions about anything and have a good one.